One of the things that you mentioned was that you were suing the CIA over Columbia. So can you talk about that case? The Institute for Policy Studies is is named on the lawsuit that I've been managing and working with a couple lawyers since 2006. But really, this case goes back to the 1990s. So it's it's around the fact that the U.S. government provided direct support and assistance, we believe, through the CIA, U.S. Army Intelligence, and the DEA to a death squad that people may have heard of if they've watched the show Narcos, although I'm not endorsing it because they get so many things wrong, Los Pepes, which was the group called People Persecuted by Pablo Escobar. So Pablo Escobar, obviously everyone knows he's probably the most famous drug lord ever. He was elevated to international um, status when he blew up a pla- helped blow up a plane going between Ecuador and Colombia and the U.S. citizens on it. So the, the U.S. government decided they wanted to get him not just arrest him, he had already been arrested and was able to operate even from within jail in Colombia, but they wanted to take him out. So Los Pepes were a group of off-duty police and also other uh, drug traffickers from a rival cartel, the Cali cartel, and the U.S. government was giving them assistance. Now, this was not a sanctioned group enforcing the law. These were killers who were not just going after Escobar, but they would murder in gruesome manner the people who worked with him, his lawyers, the teenage son of his lawyer, the people that worked cleaning the stables at, you know, his haciendas. So not not drug criminals and not killers, but anyone having to do with it. And it was expressly prohibited in U.S. law to give assistance to criminals, especially death squads and, and what they would now call terrorists. So in 1993, after Paulo Escobar was killed, I was an intern at Amnesty International. We began submitting FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests, to the CIA and other agencies asking what did they know about Los Pepes and there were any relationship between the U.S. government. Because remember, apart from Israel, Colombia was the number one recipient of U.S. military aid for decades, the largest in the hemisphere. Plan Colombia was just starting at that point. We were sending, the U.S. government was sending hundreds of millions of dollars every year to the Colombian police and the Colombian military. And the hands of the U.S. government were dripping with blood in this conflict that was happening in Colombia. So we began submitting the FOIA requests. The CIA responded with what's called the Glomar defense. We can neither confirm or deny the existence or the non-existence of Los Pepes, which is obviously bullshit, right? Of course they know. And so, but if you want to force them to actually answer, you have to sue. So we began suing them, and for for other reasons that we don't have time to get into, that they actually stalled that lawsuit, and I picked it up again with the Institute for Policy Studies in 2006. I refiled all the FOIAs, and we submitted that to it, and we filed it in a federal court in Washington, and we won. The judge said the Glomar defense is not adequate. You must actually turn over documents related to. Escobar and the death of Escobar and Los Pepes. So thus began the process of the CIA and then all these other agencies that had, they they had documents, they had to refer back to them, DEA, FBI, Defense Intelligence Agency, all these documents, they had to turn over to us. And so they turned over a portion and then years went by. It, it, I mean, it was a 2006. Think about how long we've been fighting this. They turned over a little bit at a time, then they take forever. The judge gives them a little bit of leeway, and then they used every excuse in the book to delay. Then finally, we got we got hundreds of documents. And if you go to pepes.exposed, you'll actually see the first group of documents. The later ones are not up there yet. But then what happened was the law, they actually took so long to turn over these documents that FOIA law actually changed. And so I would get a, do- a, a document that would be um, a defense intelligence report for the Western Hemisphere. And there would be one sentence that I could read and everything else was redacted. And then the, a lot of portions they would redact and say non-responsive. And this is what's key to the change in the law. It would say, we are supposed to accept on faith that the CIA is saying nothing else in this document pertains to what you're asking us about. Here's the one sentence that does and everything else you can't see. Well, they're no longer allowed to do that. They actually have to 
give you either specific national security exemptions or other legal reasons to redact things, and non-responsive is no longer sufficient. So they had to go back and re-release thousands of pages. And lo and behold, we found so much more information that was supposedly non-responsive that actually was responsive and was giving us a much bigger picture of what was happening, how in, in bed, essentially, the U.S. government and the U.S. agencies were with these forces working against Escobar. But also, what I didn't mention is Los Pepes didn't just end with Los Pepes. After pa Pablo Escobar was killed, they had already been so uh, emboldened and connected with U.S. government and other agencies, they morphed into what became the National Paramilitary Alliance in Colombia, the AUC. This is a group that was responsible for 75% of the human rights violations throughout Colombia's civil war. So the direct predecessor who had received U.S. agency support, information, connections, government connections, partially connected to the Cali cartel, we're talking about the Castaño brothers, Fidel and Carlos Castaño, they became the AUC. They were Los Pepes. So it's like the U.S. made the worst nightmare for the people in Colombia all to go after Pablo Escobar. And that's why the book about this that everyone should read by Mark Bowden called um, Killing Pablo talks about the blowback. This is exactly what blowback is. It's like Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. One day your friend who will use unscrupulous, illegal and terrible methods to achieve whatever result, the next day they become your enemy because you've propped them up to be that way. And Colombia is a perfect example of how US foreign policy, when it does not respect human rights, will backfire and cause harm against the very people that it's allegedly trying to help. And one last thing I wanna say that's so infuriating is that John Kerry to this day is still talking about Plan Colombia as a success and he used it as a model to say how he could implement that as part of his work, a, a similar strategy, part of his work as a climate envoy in this, his current position. And everybody working on human rights in Colombia just lost their mind when he did that. Like, no, we all know how terrible Plan Colombia was and the legacy of harm and destruction that goes on to this day. And yet he's quoting it. And you said, you know, this is what happens when the United States foreign policy isn't guided by human rights, but it never is. You know, there is a law that says that the U.S. government cannot give military aid to company or to um, countries that are engaged in massive human rights violations, and it it at the time in the 19, early 1990s, it would mean that you would have to cut off all aid to a country, which was never implemented because, of course, as you're pointing out, human rights have never been at the top of the of the agenda. Credit President Carter for putting human rights on the map when it came to the State Department and the way they operate. But then after that, um, I, as an intern, this is one of the stories that I tell young people when they're getting into human rights advocacy, especially in Washington. As an intern, I drafted a document that showed um, you, battalions and brigades in the Colombian government that, had, that were involved in human rights violations. We gave it to Senator Leahy's office. Senator Leahy raised it with the State Department in a hearing and said, are any of these units receiving military aid? And the State Department said no. And then lo and behold, leaked information that came out from US Southcom showed that they were all getting US aid. In fact, Frank Smythe, who's a friend and a great investigative journalist, had gotten handwritten notes on that same memo that I wrote as an intern showing what they did. So they went, Leahy went back and said, Actually, evidence shows that they are getting aid. We need to be able to cut off aid to any unit that is involved in human rights violation. And they drafted what was at that time called the Leahy Amendment, which was an amendment to the Foreign Operations Appropriation Act. And it said specifically, counter narcotics money, military aid can't go to these units. And that is now today the Leahy Law. It was, re, it was put in every year until it became a matter of law. And now you can go to the US government and say, this. 12th Brigade of the whatever army no longer can receive aid. And that's a more surgical way to actually advance human rights advocacy because the, the burden of being able to stop all aid to a country is so difficult, but it can actually force some accountability within those countries. And that came out of this Columbia campaign and this advocacy. Why didn't the CIA just destroy their files 
or documents or do they well, sometimes that we and we just don't know about it? Well, yeah, let's, you know, I've gotten a bunch of documents. I don't know what I don't have. Right. But what's interesting is that Mark Bowden, the, the author I told you about who wrote that book, Killing Pablo, Mark Bowden got a former DEA agent to, well, we believe that's who it was, leak hundreds of documents to him that show these messages, these cables going back and forth between the U.S. Embassy and the State Department that showed information that those documents have not shown up yet. So I don't know where they are. I'm still right. waiting for them. What happens is when you submit a FOIA relic like this, the CIA will say, we have 400 documents, but we have 600 documents that actually originated with the DEA. So before we can give them to you, we have to refer that to the DEA and then they go through and they redact it and they send it to us. So I've gotten documents from all these different agencies, but they're the ones that the CIA happen to have in its possession. And of course, they protect everything and they give you what's called a Vaughn index of all the documents that they're withholding in their entirety. And they say, we, to protect our sources and methods, we, we can't release any of this information to you. Now, we're talking about something that happened over 25 years ago. Most of the people involved either aren't working with the CIA, aren't working with the Colombian government, or have been killed. So I, I'm pretty skeptical about what their need is to protect their sources, sources and methods for something that happened so long ago. But they continue to use that defense. So what we do next is we go back through, and this is now, mind you, I'm the associate director at Amazon Watch. It's a full-time job, and the Amazon is at critical risk. Yeah. So on my nights and weekends, I'm going through thousands of documents and then pulling out areas where my lawyers have to go back into court and say, we want to challenge this with you, Your Honor, and get the judge to push back on their redactions. And you know, it, as I said, it started in 2006. I'm hoping I finish it before I retire, if I ever get to retire, yeah. because it's it's an epic battle. But it's so important because once we reveal what's going on, it will affect how people move into the future and what these agencies can do. Right. And FOIA law in general, like as I mentioned, the law itself has changed. So as we continue to push back, we gain more access, more free, literally freedom of information for people to find out what's happening and what their own government is doing. That's the key issue here, right? This is our government. We have a right to know what they're doing with our money and resources and how it affects foreign policy and the lives of other people, because we're, we're ultimately partially responsible for what everything the U.S. government does as citizens. 